right, uh, we are going uh, rapid fire through the Gospel of Mark, partly because uh, we took a long time with the book of Matthew, didn't we? And that text covers most all of the book of Mark. And so since we already covered that in Matthew, remember a lot of scholars, most scholars think that probably Mark wrote first and then uh, he was an apostle, Matthew was an apostle, so Mat Matthew took a look at that and said, well, that's good, and I'm just going to expand on that and write around the rest of it, so he didn't change it much. Uh, but it's also possible that Matthew was written first, or, uh, and then Mark just wanted a real short, quick version that he could get out to the Gentile people, the Roman uh, and Greek-speaking peoples, and so it could have gone that direction as well. Uh, but Mark is a short book, and we've already covered most of it in Matthew, so we're moving to uh, quickly and also partly because Mark is written to be read quickly. It keeps these action verbs. It says next and then and it's just supposed to be moving along quickly. So we're spending less time on the details than we did in, in Matthew where we really were taking time with each verse. Today's message is entitled The Heart of Darkness and, and John Cook got that reference right away to Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, a very famous book. This chapter contains two miraculous signs pointing to who Christ is. Uh, miracles are signs. Signs like flashing neon lights, and they're pointing uh, to tell us who Christ is and what's his mission. God just doesn't do miracles for, for no reason. And also two episodes that get to the very heart of the human heart and reveal it to be a very dark place. And one of the ways we know that... Uh, God is real, and this is kind of an interesting thought, is because evil is real. If there's no God, there's no such thing as good and evil, and there is no such thing as evil. But you look around the world, and you've got to say there is evil. And you look at your own heart, and you know you're struggling with the darkness inside there. There is such a thing as evil, and evil, uh, there wouldn't be evil unless there was goodness. Goodness comes first. It's like a straight stick and then a broken stick. You, you know something's crooked because we already understand the concept of straight. There is goodness. That's why we know there is evil. There is obviously uh, good and evil in the universe, and that's how we have this reality. The human heart is a dark place. You don't need to teach a child. No parent ever thinks, I have to teach my child to be selfish. You don't need to teach a child to lie, uh, to cover up, to try to hide, to be deceptive. You don't need to teach a child to yell and stamp their foot when they don't get what they want. That darkness comes natural. We need, we need parents to teach us how to be civilized, how to make right choices, how to be godly people. And God is working with our dark souls. Uh, we have this sin nature, this darkness within, and uh, Jesus Christ loves us anyways. He looked down at a world full of darkness, full of sin. This whole world is full of tears, full of heartbreak, full of betrayal. People letting you down. We're letting ourselves down. We're not the people. I'm not the man I wish I was. There's all this. Colby. There's all this uh, pain and darkness in this world. And uh, Jesus, instead of looking down and saying, I'm done with them, he said, I'm going to come and do something about it. And he took responsibility for all my nastiness. Everything I've ever said, thought, done to people. All the times I hurt the people that love me. All the times I've been selfish and self-righteous and, and hard-headed and just plain old nasty. Jesus Christ took all that mess on himself and said, I'm going to pay the price of your sin. And that's what the cross is all about. So we have a God who looks down at our mess and says, I want to help you. I want to come down into that. I want to, I want to save you. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says about uh, chapter 7 of Mark, says Mark portrays Jesus as, quote, he is a man of action and he is doing the things that would appeal to the Roman of the day and to any person interested in getting the job done. That is the wonderful thing about him as a savior. He can save, and he's the only one who can. You name me one philosopher, one politician, your favorite teacher at school, 
who can deal with the nastiness in your heart, the human heart. And it's only Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we're going to see today that Jesus has the great task of tackling the hearts of fallen humanity, and Jesus is up to the task. We've got, these, we've got this tremendous problem. We talked about uh, one in Sunday school class. We're all going to die. Nobody in the history of the world, no matter how good they were, no matter how hard they prayed, how many people loved them, uh, who, is, who was alive 200 years ago is alive today. Everybody dies eventually. And the other big problem we have is this darkness in our hearts. Listen, brothers and sisters, look at your own heart. Isn't there a nastiness there? Isn't there a hardness there, a bitterness, an unforgiveness? It's so easy to, to feel sorry for ourselves. It's so easy to look down at other people. And so many wretched things come out of our hearts. And so we've got these huge, gigantic beasts, death and sin. And no philosophy, no psychology, no politician can deal with these things. Only Jesus Christ can deal with them. He is up to the task. All right, let's open our, our books now to Mark chapter 7. <coughs> Mark chapter 7. You're going to read the first eight verses. We bought this, uh, the church bought this piano when we were still a mobile church at uh, the Best Western Hotel, and we've had it ever since, and nice to get some use out of it in today. Uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, this is Mark chapter 7 from verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of the disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. I guess if you're... If people can tell you didn't wash your hands, they are pretty grubby, pretty nasty. Now, verse 3 uh, starts a parenthetical statement. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding the traditions of the elders. When they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions. You're not going to believe this. They actually wash their cups and pitchers and, and kettles. Uh, probably a, an older version of the text says, and their reclining couches because they would eat laying on their sides. Uh, so the Pharisees, and the, isn't that funny? Because we all think, of course you're going to wash your cup and your kettle and everything. But he's not just talking about being cleanly here. This was a religious ceremony. This had to do with their, with their religion. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with dirty hands? And re he replied, these are the words of Jesus, Isaiah was right. The prophet Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human tradition. Wouldn't you hate to have God look down from heaven and said, Foundation Bible Church, you worship me in vain. Dan Wolf, you worship me in vain. Wouldn't that be the worst? If God looked down at us and saying, you're just full of tradition, you're full of ritual, you're just going through the motions, and your worship means nothing to me. Would Jesus, if he were to walk in the back door today, uh, call me a hypocrite? Well, probably <laughs> Uh, the Holy Spirit is showing me my hypocrisy all the time, and I don't see why Jesus would do any different. A verse that Adam, Brother Adam, keeps bringing up is Jeremiah 17, 9. Listen to this. The heart is deceitful more than anything else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, now you're thinking, wait a second. The Bible says the heart is deceitful more than anything else. But every Disney movie I grew up with said, just follow your heart, right? Uh, yeah, that's what our culture tells us. Our culture tells us, if you feel it in your heart, just go chase after your heart. Follow your heart. Follow, follow whatever pops up in your heart. And the Bible says, your heart is going to lie to you. Your heart is wicked. We are wicked. Desperately wicked. 
beyond cure other than through Jesus Christ. Well, what does that tell me? If I'm going to be wise, I better understand my heart is telling me lies. My heart is telling me lies. My heart's going to tell me you have a right to be ticked off at everybody else. You have a right to feel sorry for yourself. You have, you, you have a right to hold a grudge. You have a right to, to really punish this person and make them feel bad. You have a right to that property. You have a right to, to, to treat people less than human. You have a right to, to, to speak badly about that group of people because they're different. Your heart is going to lie to you all the time. Either that or you could say, yeah, but I'm... 22 years old, or I'm 17, or I'm 46, or I'm 60. I think I'm smarter than the God who made the universe. I think I can trust my heart. I want to ask you a question. Where's that got you? Trust in your heart? It's a lot of misery, right? A lot of hardship. Think about what Christ has said here. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. You know, when God comes down, he calls him as he sees him. Jesus is standing there with the, with, the, with the Pharisees. He says, all right, well, you guys are hypocrites. No, 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 we're not going to argue about that. I know. God knows. Bunch of hypocrites. As is written, these people honor me with their lips. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the made-up precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the traditions of men. Notice the problem was not that they washed their hands or their pots or their plates or their reclining couch. That's not the problem. The problem was the attitude of their hearts. It's not the ritual in itself. It's where your heart is at. Again, brothers and sisters, if Jesus came into our church today, would he say that, well, you sound pretty when you sing? I don't know if he'd say that. But would he say you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are not with me? Where are our hearts? Are they with him? In, in Matthew 6.21, we heard Jesus say, For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Well, we know because Jesus went to the cross to die for you and I. He's trying to gather all people to him. Jesus, God, sees you as a treasure. He was willing to give everything, to go through immense suffering in order to save you from hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants to treasure you. He wants to love you and value you. But then he asks us this question, where is your treasure? For where your treasure is, that's going to be where your heart is. And you could talk about loving Jesus all you want, but where is your heart? And we tend to think, well, as long as I dump some money, as long as I write my check and put it in, in the offering plate, then I can check off this box. Uh, uh, giving to God, check. I gave money, safe. I don't have to think about it anymore. And, and there's some element to that. Obviously, if we prioritize other things before our offering, that does reveal where our heart is at. The Bible says, give your first fruits to God, because God knows we don't have, often have a lot of leftovers. Give your first fruits to God. When you're, when you're, when you're a farmer, you give your first percentage of your crops to God. When you get that check, set some aside for God right away. Because we end up doing stuff like this. I can't give any money to God because then I couldn't pay my cable bill. I, I can go out to eat, get a cheeseburger, but I can't give any money to God. But you know what? It's not limited to just where you spend your money. That's too easy. It's too easy to write a check and forget about it. It's too easy to, to, to give some money in the offering plate and walk away from it. What if it has to do with everything about us? Where do you spend your time? 
what, what do I daydream about? What stirs your passion? Because that's where your heart is. Do you care that people are going to hell? No, I don't care. Well, yeah, it's because your heart is not with Jesus. What is the treasure that's captured your heart? Is it worth dying for? Another question, is it going to save you from your sins? Is it going to save you from hell? What is the treasure that's captured your heart? Jesus wants that to be him. I, I think that's an amen. What's the treasure that's captured your heart? What stirs your passion? Well, I love football. Yeah, that's one of the treasures. Go, yeah? Yeah. What's, what's the treasure that captured your heart? Because Jesus wants that to be him. He loves us, and he wants us to love him. Did, did you catch that? God of the universe wants to be your treasure. Treasure. The Bible says that, uh, you know, he's the apple of our eye. Well, you're the apple of his eye. If he cared enough for you to go to the cross, his desire is that we would love him in return. So what do you daydream about? What stirs your passion? Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not enough to say, I love you, Jesus, check and go through the religious motions and rituals and the traditions of, of our church or any other church, Jesus wants your attention. Jesus wants my attention. Don't just say you love your wife, then, then never talk to her. You think she's going to buy it? Well, you think God, you, you know, you could sign some God insurance? I love you, Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Now I can go to heaven, and now I don't want to think about you. And do you think that's going to work? God wants your attention because... He cares about you. He loves you. He, his attention is focused on you. And he wants what stirs us, what motivates us, our breath, our thoughts, our prayers to be about him. He wants our attention. He wants our love. And in our brilliance, yeah, I'm being sarcastic. In our brilliance, we like to settle for ritual made-up traditions, a comfort zone where I can check a few religious boxes and then kind of ignore Jesus for the rest of the week. Jesus wants to save us from empty religion. Religion is worthless without Jesus. Religion doesn't even interest me. Religion is just something that hypocritical people do to make ourselves feel good about ourselves so we can look down at other people. That's such a waste of time, and God has no patience for that. Let's look at, at Mark chapter 7 now, 9 through 13. And Jesus continued. So, I mean, he was already pretty hard on them. You hypocrites, you're, you worship me in vain. You just, you just, you've let go of God's commands and are holding on to human tradition. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own way of doing things. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is now korban, which is a Hebrew word that means devoted to God. And the interesting thing about korban is you'd, you'd say, like, I can't, th th what they were doing is saying, I can't help my elderly parents because. I got $10,000 that I'm going to give to God. But the thing is about Korban, you just set it aside. You designate it to give to God, but you don't necessarily know when you're going to, when you're going to give it. So what they're doing is designating, oh, I w wish I could help my parents, but I've set this money aside for God. You see, how does, how does that fly in heaven? When you are not taking care of your own parents, and not only that, you're trying to make yourself look religious. Oh, he's such a good man because he's going to give that money to God. And God's looking down from heaven. He said, I told you to honor your parents. And now you're trying to use me to look good as you cheat your parents. Brothers and sisters, 
Don't try to play games with religion. It doesn't work with God. But you say that what, if anyone declares what might have been used to help his father and mother as korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition. Thus, you nullify, you make void the word of God. The word of God you're making empty by human tradition, human religion that you've handed down, and you do many things like this. <laughs> Remember, brothers and sisters, it's easy to be hard on the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees were the political, social, and religious conservatives of their day. They loved their country. They, they, they wanted to institute the kingdom of God, heaven on earth. They had their idea of what that was going to look like. Turned out it wasn't the same way that God was thinking. But they had lost their way. And at some point, they had more passion for their way of life than they had love for God. They had more passion for their way of life, the way we do things in our church, the way we do things in our country, the way we do things in our family. They had more passion for these rules than love for God so that when other people didn't do things like their family, their church, their nation, they were able to write them off. They were able to look down at them. They were able to feel, elevate themselves in superiority and look down at other people. These people had found a way of honoring their parents. They actually found a way out of honoring their parents, and thus they nullified God's law. Uh, real quick. The Bible tells us that when a husband and wife are married, the husband cleaves to his wife, the two become one, you leave your father and mother. But that doesn't mean we're not supposed to respect them or care for them anymore. We, we, when a husband and wife get married, they're their own family. Mom and dad don't call the shots anymore. They're their own family. But we're still to honor our parents. Jesus, the Bible is talking about adults here, telling them, honor your father and mother. They raised you. God says you ought to care for them. The people, they found a way out of honoring their parents, and they nullified God's law. The American church, by the way, does this all the time. And I was sitting thinking, and there were so many that I decided not to write them down because so many, so many different ways we do things. The American spirit, we're individualistic. The Bible calls us to community. I'm an American. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. The Bible tells us to obey our leaders. Jesus said, love your enemies. And we say, okay, I'll love them, I guess, if you say to, some hypothetical kind of love, but I don't have to like them or care for them. Thus, you nullify God's command. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But we spend our days, we spend our days looking for reasons to be disappointed in our spouses, in our, in our country, in our church, in our friends. We spend our days complaining and moping. Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you. And we go the other direction, thus we nullify, make void God's will word in our lives. Jesus commands us in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus commands, this is the great commission. Go, therefore. Jesus says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Not just people who say, check, I believe, check. Make disciples of every ethnic group, every people group. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything that I commanded you. Jesus said, go out, make people disciples, baptize them, teach them everything in this book. Teach him to obey everything that he's taught us. He says, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And we say in the American church, it's not polite to talk about religion. It's not politically correct to talk about religion. I don't want to push my beliefs on somebody else. I don't want somebody to be upset with me. Jesus, the one who died for us, God who 
who created the entire universe, who holds it in his hands, said, you go and bring people into this family, save them from hell, teach them all the good things, teach them everything I've commanded you. And we say, no, I don't think that's polite. Well, you are making the word of God void. You are nullifying the word of God. Jesus commands you to go, and I say, I'd rather not. It's not polite to talk about religion, or, or I want to say moderation in all things. Yeah? Jesus tells you to go. Jesus tells you to teach everything. Jesus tells you to make disciples, and you're going to say to him, moderation. You want to say that to him before he goes to the cross to die for you? If he had done things in moderation, we wouldn't have heaven, would we? We wouldn't have salvation. I know Jesus went to the cross for my soul, but I don't want to get too extreme about actually caring for people, trying to save somebody's soul from eternal damnation. don't want to get too extreme. Moderation. I'm glad Jesus did not love me moderately. I'm glad he just opened up heaven and poured love on top of me and was willing to forgive all my sins. And that's the way we create human traditions that allow us to pretend we're religious while we actually nullify the word of God. What a cheap exchange. Human, crappy human-made rules for a relationship with the living God. What a cheap exchange. We rob our souls. The human heart is a black pit. It is vile. It is cunning. My heart it is deceptive, exceedingly wicked. And Jesus came to save us from ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that he loved me enough to save me from myself. I can be so miserable and ornery and nasty and selfish, and he loves me anyways. And he wants to draw me close. And he, he says, I'm going to give you new life. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to give you a purpose in your life. I'm going to give you meaning. And now I want you, because I've done so much for you, I want you to go out and love people enough to bring them into the family too. Moderation in all things. No, no, no. You go out there and you love people. I died for you. Now go live for me. Let's look now at Mark chapter 7, 14 to 23. And again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of you can defile you by going into you. Rather, it is what comes out of you that defiles you. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him what, about this parable. And he said, Are you so dull? <laughs> Don't you guys get it? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters you from the outside can defile you, for it doesn't go into your heart. The food doesn't go into your heart, but into your stomach and then out of your body, and your Bible is being way too polite. The word out of your body means down the drain into the latrine. Jesus is being very graphic. Are you guys so dull? It goes in your mouth, in your stomach, and then down the latrine. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of you is what defiles you. For from within, out of your hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, Arrogance and folly, all these evils come from inside you and defile you. God calls him like he sees him, the black heart of humanity. This is what God has to say about my heart and your heart. This is why we need a Savior. Don't tell me how good you are. I'm not buying it. I know myself. I know myself. I'm not buying how good you are. This is why we need somebody who's not in our mess, who has no sin, to reach down and save us. 
Is Christ up to the job? Well, chapter 7 goes on to relate two examples of Christ's miraculous powers. Again, a miracle is a sign, a flashing neon sign in history that points to who Christ is and what his mission was. We see Christ casting out a fallen angel. And he's healing a man who is deaf and has trouble speaking. And the response of the people in Mark 7, 37 was, they were utterly astonished. Jesus did these miracles to point to who he was, and the people were astonished. Don't think, well, if I lived in Bible days, these, I'd be seeing these things all the time. They were astonished because God was doing something special. Then they said, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. I want us to think about this. These are not made-up stories that were meant to be metaphors about what Christ can accomplish in your heart. We don't go from, we don't start with fairy tales and say, but look at what Christ can do in your heart. We start with a tremendous problem, two tremendous beasts, death and sin, the heart of darkness found in every human being. And from there, Jesus heals some people externally in a visible manner so that we can have confidence and we can know he can accomplish the job. He can do what he set out to do. This is someone who can deal with the trouble in my soul. Jesus did all these things well, and Jesus is doing things well today in our own lives. Amen? Amen. These people were starting to get a glimpse of who Christ was and what he could do. And today, Christ can break Satan's hold on our lives. He's the only one who can. There is no psychology. There is no self-help seminar that, that we can, you know, with, with self-help seminars, we can overcome addictions, and we can learn how to become successful in this world, but only Christ can deal with the true problem, the black as midnight sin on the inside. It's been said that sin is so virulent that it corrupts any scalpel used to cut it out. And so if I'm able to stop a certain sin in my life, you know what pops up? Pride, because look at me. I'm not like other people that are chained to that stuff. I'm free. Sin corrupts everything. We need a Savior. He can open our ears so we can hear truths about him and ourselves that we would never have imagined before. And when you come to Jesus, you start to learn something about yourself. I'm not as wonderful as I thought I was. When you get close to the light, you start to see the darkness on the inside. It's easy to imagine your hands are clean if you're in a dark room. But let's say you're in a big gymnasium at a school and there's one light on the corner and and you're filthy, but you don't know it. You think, I'm pretty good. And you walk a little closer to the light and you say, you know what? I probably got to rinse my hands a little bit, but I'm pretty clean. You get closer and you say, wow, but at least I'm better than other people. And you closer you get to that light, you say, oh, my goodness. How nasty, how messed up I am. Because now I'm close to God and God is good. And by comparison, I see I'm not good. Jesus, please wash me with your blood. I need to be cleansed from my sin. I need forgiveness. There is no hope in me. So we can, he can open our ears. To, we can hear truths about him, about his goodness, and about how wonderful he is. We can hear truths about ourselves. We would have never imagined hearing these things before. And only he can cause us to say things we would have never said before. Jesus, I love you. I'm going to follow you. I give my life to you. These things, before we become a believer, we'd never imagine we'd ever say those things. And suddenly it makes sense. And we got to say, i got to do this. i got to get on my knees. I have to give my life to Jesus because it's darkness in here. And it's darkness out there. But I see light shining from heaven, and I want to run to the light. And we need to be aware of the darkness within. There is no philosophy or political theory or drug that can deal with my sin or yours, only Jesus. We need to be aware of this and so we will turn to Jesus. We need to know that we need the light of the Savior. The trick is, it's always tricky, we must be aware of our own sin. and We've got to be aware of our proclivity to self-deception. We must but we must not wallow in that. We ha can't wallow in self-condemnation. We can't wallow in self-hatred. Jesus doesn't want that for us. He wants us to know our sins so we'll reach up, find his forgiveness. It's pride to ignore your own messed up heart. 
in its self-absorption to wallow in your misery. Both of these extremes rob us in our relationship with Christ. We don't want to be full of pride and we don't want to be self-absorbed in our own misery. This is tricky and it's going to take genuine faith in a genuine Savior. Say, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. I want to live for you. Ideally, we should be keenly aware of our fallenness and the Holy Spirit is daily revealing to us where we fall short and this enables us to be humble. And by the way, if we see our own sin, it becomes easier to forgive the sin in other people. When I see how messed up I am, it becomes easier to have grace for other people. I don't have to hold them to this standard that I don't even live up to. And at the same time, we walk in life and we say, I am blessed. Can you say that? I am blessed. Let's hear it. I am I'm overwhelmed by the goodness of God. He gives me so much I don't deserve. We find peace in God's acceptance of us. Isn't that beautiful? I'm accepted by God. All this, all the darkness, and I'm accepted by God. He takes me as I am. Don't ever think I'll get polished up and cleaned up, then I'll become a Christian. You'll never be good enough. <coughs> we walk in joy, not because we're so wonderful. That'd be a joke. We walk in joy because he's so wonderful. We walk in joy because once we understand how much God has forgiven us and is forgiving us, listen to this, once we understand how much God has forgiven us, everything else is gravy. When I celebrate the cross, Jesus died for me. I can be forgiven. I get eternal life. Every other blessing is just a bonus. Every blessing undeserved. Every blessing, when we have the right mindset, appreciated. Pharisees always, always miss freedom and the joy of grace. There's no joy. There's no peace because they're too critical. They're hard on others. And they can be hard on themselves as well, which is a lack of faith. Jesus said, I forgive you. Are you going to believe him or not? And their lives reflect nothing of the joy of Christ. They're trapped by habit, ritual, and tradition. In 2 Chronicles 12, 14, Jesus tells us that the evil king Rehoboam, you know, nobody names their kids Rehoboam. There's a reason for that, because he was an evil king. But the evil king Rehoboam did evil. Why? Because he did not set his heart on seeking God. He did evil because he didn't set his heart on seeking God. I'm messed up. My sin nature is just as lost as the day I was saved. It doesn't get polished up. It's going to die. My new life in Christ is going to live. There is no hope in me. There's no hope in here, none. I can't save myself. The job is too big for me. I can't fight death. I can't fight sin. But not for Christ. It's not too big for Jesus. And that's where I'm looking for my hope. Where else are you going to look in this world? TV? In a bottle? In some magazine? If our hope is not in Jesus, what else is there on this planet? There's nothing. Let's be realistic. There is no other hope. If the Bible says the wicked king Rehoboam did evil because he did not set his heart on seeking the Lord, then I want to set my heart to seek the Lord, to seek Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. You want to follow Jesus? I want to live for Jesus. I want every breath to be about Jesus. I want to have his goodness in my life because my messed up ways don't make it work. I already know that there is nothing in me. There's nothing in me that can save me. There's no hope in me. There is no hope in meaningless ritual. No hope in this crazy world. My hope is in God. And if he wants my heart, such as it is, he can have it. He can have it. And thank you, Jesus, for taking me as I am. I'm going to pray now. Brothers and sisters, if, you've, if you're a Christian already and you've had some ups and downs, we all do, you know what we need to do is continually refresh our faith and give our hearts to the Lord if you've already committed your life to Christ and following Jesus, then let's pray together to confirm that commitment, to, to renew our, our commitment to the Lord, to thank him for his commitment to us. And if you aren't sure where you stand with Jesus, 
If you aren't sure if you've really done this, have I confessed my sin? Have I said, thank you for the cross? I want Jesus in my life. If, if you're not sure if you've gotten right with the Lord, if you've made your peace with Jesus yet, if you want to make certain of that today, then I want you to pray these words in your heart too, after me. I encourage you, just pray with me and let's get this done. Get right with Jesus. Repeat the words in your heart. Give your heart, give your life, give your today, give your tomorrows, give everything to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you because he will. Ask him to come into your life because he will. Ask him to be your king because he will. Ask him to teach him teach you his ways because he will. Ask him for eternal life because he'll give it to you. Let's bow our heads now and talk with God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are and we know we're messed up. We're not going to deny that. We're not going to argue anymore. We're not going to try to justify ourselves, Lord. There's so much darkness. People don't know. So much darkness on the inside. Father, forgive us. Thank you so much that even though you see us and you know us better than we know ourselves, you, you know the sins that we don't even admit to ourselves, Lord, the ones we're denying, the ones we're trying to to justify, Lord, even though you see everything, you still love us. And you came down and you, you gave your life. You suffered. You died on the cross. And you took responsibility for all our garbage, Lord. Because you want us to be forgiven. You want us to have life with you. Jesus, I want to take that life. You're offering me forgiveness. I need that. I want to be forgiven, Lord. I want to walk with you. I want to do your life your way. I'm, I'm, my ways are messed up. I want to go your direction. Lord God, take my heart, take my life, take my everything. I want to be with you in this life. I want to be with you in eternity. And Lord God, teach me your ways. Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to love other people. Teach me how to accept your forgiveness. Teach me how to walk in joy and peace and not wallow in self-pity, Lord, not wallow in my misery. And Lord God, I pray that the love you give me, I'll give to other people too. Help me to do my life your way, my marriage your way, the way I treat others at work and in my neighborhood, Lord God. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian in everything I do and say and think. And God, I just want to thank you for being there for me. And thank you, God, for hearing this prayer. I know I don't deserve to talk to you, but your Bible tells me that you listen to everybody who calls out in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and I'm calling out. Lord, save me. Amen. Father, we just thank you that you, the God of the universe, the one who put all of the stars in the heavens, Lord, the one who created us and created all this for us, Lord, um, you call us and you say, hey, please talk to me. I want a relationship with you. And I just, I thank you so much, God. I thank you for um, renewing our hearts and minds um, for an eternal king so that we can serve you. So much, God. Amazing blessing to that. Please.
Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.